what's going on everybody it's ETA Prime back here again today we're going to be taking a look at an awesome new x86 powered single board computer from Hard Kernel known as the Odroid H3 Plus. They've released a couple new products over the past few weeks and I've got them here. Uh, I will be taking a look at the Odroid Go Ultra very soon on the channel so keep an eye out. But in this video, we're taking a look at their new x86 SBC. And if you're not familiar with Odroid, they do some really great stuff with single board computers and now handhelds with the Odroid Go. Over here, we've taken a look at the H1, the H2, and we're finally up here to number three. And they are offering two different variants of this. So you're going to look at the website and see the H3 or the H3 Plus. I'm going to tell you right now that the H3 Plus is definitely where it's at. It's got a higher end CPU in it with a max clock up to 3.3 gigahertz. So we should see some really good performance out of this when it comes to 4K video playback, emulation, and even some light gaming. And that's exactly what we're going to be testing out in this video on the H3 Plus. And since this does have an x86 CPU, we can install Windows or Linux. There's tons of other operating systems that this will support. But in this video, we're going to be running Windows 11 Pro. I've already got an SSD set up ready to go for this thing. And as you can see, it does come with a heatsink pre-installed. This is passively cooled out of the box, but we do have a spot where we can mount a fan and plug it in. It's got a four pin connector right there and it's totally addressable from the BIOS or the operating system. So adding a small fan here would definitely allow us to go full boat with the CPU at 3.3 gigahertz for a long period of time without it thermal throttling. And like it sits right now, we actually might be able to get away with that. It's got a pretty beefy heatsink on it, but after a long period of time, I mean, we could get a little bit of heat soak here. Taking a look at the I.O., as you can see, we've got two Ethernet ports, and these are both 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. So setting this up as a nice little router or a NAS would totally be possible. Unfortunately, the H3 doesn't come with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. You will have to use a USB adapter for something like that. But we've got two USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.0 ports, full-size display port, full-size HDMI. We've also got an optical audio port and two 3.5 millimeter audio jacks. The H3 does come bare bones, which means you will have to add your own storage and RAM, but we've got a few options here when it comes to storage. This will support two SATA drives, so you can do 3.5 inch or 2.5 inch drives. They've also added an eMMC slot, so you could always boot from eMMC, but on the bottom here, we've got a PCIe 3.0 NVMe M.2 slot, and that's exactly what I'm going to be running from. And down here, as you can see, we will have to add our RAM. This supports DDR4 SODIMM RAM up to 2,933 megahertz. I'm going to go with 16 gigs, but you can go up to 64 with this unit. And if you do pick one of these up, I would highly recommend running dual channel RAM like we have here. Two sticks, it's really going to help out with that GPU. And through my testing with other systems, be it Intel and AMD, I've seen up to a 40% increase in GPU performance. And we're already working with a lower end GPU, so every little bit definitely helps. And when it comes to the drive I'm using here, it's just the simple Kingston 512 gigabyte M.2 NVMe SSD. This will not support SATA M.2 drives, so just make sure you pick an NVMe drive up. So when it comes to the specs of the new Odroid H3 Plus for the CPU, we've got the Intel Celeron N6005. Remember, this is the Plus model. The regular H3 model has the N5105. And that doesn't boost as high as this one. That's really the big reason I recommended the Plus model. But with the 6005, we've got four cores and four threads and a max clock up to 3.3 gigahertz. This has built-in Intel UHD graphics with 32 execution units. It runs at up to 900 megahertz. It will support up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4 at 2,933 megahertz. We've got those two SATA 3 6 gigabyte ports right there on the side of the unit. One M.2 slot, it only supports an NVMe drive, and this will run Linux or Windows. I mean, it's really up to you, but for this video, I've got Windows 11 Pro installed, and I really wanted to test out the overall usability of this little machine, like web browsing, 4K video playback. We're definitely going to be testing out some gaming and emulation. But with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Alright, so I've been messing around with this thing for a little while. Got a lot of applications, games, and emulators we're going to be testing out. But yeah, I can tell you right now that this thing is definitely snappy for a little Windows machine, and it does handle 4K really well. This CPU runs at up to 10 watts, and our BIOS is unlocked. There's really not much more performance that we can pull out of it, given that the way they've got it set up right now, it does boost up to 3.3. We can hit that 900 megahertz on the GPU, 
And really, that's it. We don't have any overclocking going on or anything. Got that 16 gigabytes of RAM. It defaulted to 2,933 megahertz. And overall, yeah, this is a very usable little PC. Web browsing is super snappy. We don't have that built-in Wi-Fi, but connected over Ethernet, you're not going to have any issues as long as you have a decent connection. And by the way, I am on a 4K monitor right now. I've just got it scaled to, I think, 275% so we can see it. But when we do a little bit of 4K video playback from YouTube, I will turn scaling completely off just so we have a true 4K platform to work with. But yeah, web browsing, document editing, email checking, and to tell you the truth, I wouldn't mind editing some photos on this thing. I wouldn't go crazy with it with 20 layers or anything like that, but you know, home photos that need to be touched up a little bit will work out fine on this machine using something like GIMP. And I'm really glad to see that Hard Kernel did their research on this little CPU. It's set up really well out of the box. A lot of these mini PCs and single board computers with this Celeron chip or even a lower end one doesn't boost as high because they've got that TDP set so low. But Hard Kernel definitely did their research and some tweaking from that BIOS really got this thing working very, very well. So I've just turned scaling completely off with Windows 11 here. We've got a 4K 60 FPS video streaming from YouTube. On the initial load-in, we had 13 drop frames. So you can see we're at 4K. I know it's a bit hard to see up there in the top left-hand corner. But this video played all the way through with only 13 drop frames. And that's kind of normal to get those drops on the initial load-in. So yeah, I mean, it can definitely handle 4K. And even the N5105 did a pretty decent job. But since we've got those higher clocks, we can get a little more out of it. Next up, I wanted to take a look at a few benchmarks, and the first one on the list is Geekbench 5, single core, 707, multi, 2336. I also ran a couple GPU benchmarks. Here's 3 Mark Wildlife, 3254, and this tests the GPU's Vulcan performance. And finally, we've got 3 Mark Night Raid with a 4829. So yeah, it's not going to win any benchmark awards, but I'm still going to be testing out some gaming on this thing, so let's see what it can do. And first up, we've got OG Skyrim 900p low settings. I had a good feeling it was going to run this just fine. As you can see, that GPU usage isn't at 100%, and I didn't expect it to be, given that this game is more CPU intensive. But once we throw some effects on screen, you'll see it jump up a bit. Next one I wanted to test here was the Art of Rally. We're at 900p medium settings, and this is very playable. So we could probably take it down to very low settings 1080, but just at those medium settings 1080, we did have dips under 60. But I personally still think this looks great at 900p, and to tell you the truth, I've played this a lot at 720 on lower end systems. And if you take a look at Afterburner, you can see that our CPU is getting on up there. We're at 88 degrees Celsius, so I'm just going to add a small fan here for the next games that we're going to be testing. I always like to throw at least one fighting game in, so here's Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. We're at 720p low settings, and I've got resolution scale set to around 80%. We can do that with the custom settings in this game. Not quite there at 60, we'd probably have to drop those down to around 50%, maybe even lower to get a nice steady 60 out of it, but it's definitely trying its hardest. Okay, so we know World of Warcraft has been out for a long time, it's very well optimized, but to see it running over 100 FPS on this little system is pretty impressive. We're at 720p, I've got that graphic slider set to number 3 there, we could probably go up a bit higher at 720p. But with the way it's set up, it's perfectly playable on the Odroid H3+. I knew we weren't going to be able to run this game at full speed, but I was at least hoping for 30 FPS with the lowest of the low settings. Forza Horizon 5, 720p, we're at very low, and I've got the resolution scale set as low as we can go. We can't quite hit 30 with it, but I really wanted to try this one because it's a very well optimized game, but we just don't have enough power. Now it's time to see what this thing can do with emulation, and the first one we're testing here is PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP, Tekken 6, Vulcan backend, 4x resolution, run it at a constant 60. Had a feeling we'd have really great performance with PSP, and Tekken 6 isn't the hardest one to run, so I tested out Chains of Olympus. 
I wasn't able to do 4x with this one. I did have to drop it down to 2x, but we still get that Vulcan back end going. And it's running really decently. So yeah, PSP emulation on this machine is totally possible. And if you wanted to do N64, Dreamcast, Neo Geo, SNES, it's also going to run it at full speed. I just kind of wanted to go with the more higher end stuff. And so far, so good. Checking out some GameCube and Wii emulation using the Dolphin emulator. Soul Calibur 2, 720p, DirectX 11 back end. This game runs great. It's not the hardest one to run, so let's take it up just a bit more. Same Dolphin emulator, same exact settings, DirectX 11 back end, 720p, but we've got some Wii here with Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, one of my favorite fighting games. Looking great here, very playable just like it is right now. There are a few tweaks that we could do in the background, but this isn't telling the whole story about the Dolphin emulator, because there's one we definitely need to test here, and that's F-Zero GX. And unfortunately, on one of the harder courses here, Fire Field, it just falls right on its face. I've tried the OpenGL backend, DirectX 11, DirectX 12, Vulcan, and we're only at 1x here. We just can't get full speed out of this game on the harder courses. Now on the easier courses, yeah, it actually runs really well at 1x with the DirectX 11 backend, but Firefield is just one of those levels that is really hard to emulate. I also wanted to test out some Wii U emulation using the SimU emulator. And for the easier to emulate games, it does handle them pretty well. Those games that run at 30 FPS or just don't take a lot of CPU power to run, like Pac-Man here, will run pretty decently on this hardware, but just like the Dolphin emulator, you will run into games that aren't going to run at full speed. Here's Bayonetta 2, and with this I actually tried to take the resolution down a little under 720p just to see if we could at least get 60 out of it, and it's just not going to do it. And the final emulator I wanted to test here, at least in Windows, was PS2 using PCSX2. Easy one to run, Crash Bandicoot, Wrath of Cortex, we're at 720p, got the DirectX 11 back in. And as you can see, this one is performing great, but uh, when I moved over to Gran Turismo 4, it fell on its face just like those other higher-end emulators. Now, I will admit that some of these emulators may run better in Linux. I really do think that we're going to get better performance with Wii U and Linux on this little machine, so I'll have a video coming up soon on that. We could run Potosera on this or Manjaro Linux. Let me know exactly what distro you want to see running on the H3+. Okay, so another thing I always like to take a look at with these smaller single board computers or mini PCs is total system power consumption. While I'm running this, I have it plugged into a kilowatt meter at the wall. At idle, we measured around 2.1 watts. Not bad at all. Gaming, it would jump up to 15.8. And the maximum that I could get this thing to hit while stressing out the CPU and GPU was 18 watts. And remember, this wasn't with any SATA drives attached or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, we've got a low power consumption board here also. So first impressions of the Odroid H3 Plus. I'm actually liking the performance this thing's putting out right now. It is performing better than the H1 or the H2, and we definitely expected that. I wish they would add Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but you know, I understand it does keep the cost down for manufacturing and everything like that. Plus, we have dual 2.5 gigabit Ethernet here, which is really handy if you wanted to turn this into a little NAS or a Plex server. And given that we can add extra SATA drives here is a big plus. Now, I would like to make at least one more video with this thing running Linux. So whatever distro you guys want to see, let me know in the comments below. It could be Botosera for straight retro gaming, or we could go with Manjaro so we could do both there. That's based on Arch, and we could also get some Linux gaming and emulation out of the way with that one. If you're interested in learning more about the Odroid H3+, Plus, I will leave a few links in the description. And let me know what you think about the performance here in the comments below. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. And like always, thanks for watching.